Hey everyone, I'm really excited to share this video with you. This is an interview with Jack Collins, who I had as a professor in seminary back in 2007 and 2008 and times like that. Um, he teaches at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. He's a professor of Old Testament there, and he's written a great deal about the early chapters of Genesis, um, Adam and Eve, issues of science and faith, and how to be good readers of these chapters. I've learned a great deal from him. I'm really excited uh, for you to benefit from his wisdom too. Um, he's written a number of books, and I'll put the details to this one in the video description. It's called Reading Genesis Well. This book came out in 2018 from Zondervan Academic, and it's a really helpful book, and I'm really excited for you to benefit from it as I have. We're gonna talk about uh, how literally do we read these chapters in Genesis? Are they poetry or prose or some combination? Um, and and what, are, what is the ultimate purpose of these chapters? What is God trying to say to us through them? So I hope this is useful to you. And I'll have more interviews like this coming out. So if this is helpful, um, you can subscribe. There should be a little button. I think it's in the bottom right of your screen. You can click on that and that'll, that way Google will have to tell you about future videos that come out. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy. I'm just gonna, I'll show everybody this book here that uh, oh. <laughs> very, came as a very welcome arrival in my mailbox of some weeks ago. Well, I was planning on holding up your book. And the interesting thing is both of these books were written in the same office. So <laughs> I think some of your brain power must have had residual effect over the next year while I was there. But um, yeah. And I think the authors were uh, living in the same space, as a matter of fact. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah, maybe we could just start with that. So I want to First of all, I'll say thank you so much for making the time for this. Um, I'm really grateful. And I want to hold up your book, which is Reading Genesis Well, Navigating History, Poetry, Science, and Truth in Genesis 1 through 11. And we'll be talking all about this, but just want to really encourage people watching this to pick it up. It's an academic book, but I think anybody who has an interest in these topics could find usefulness in it. So um, maybe we could just start with you sharing a little bit about the book, how it came about. Um, sure what made you write it? Well, the book actually uh, brings together things that have been stewing in my mind for, oh, 20 years or more. Uh, and so the opportunity to write the book uh, was really the opportunity finally to put all these things together. And then uh, when the Carl Henry Center got their funding for the creation project, um, I thought really just on a lark, okay, well, I'll send in an application and see what happens. Uh, and they accepted my application. I was allowed to have a year of leave from my seminary duties, and I was able just to spend time at the Carl Henry Center in Chicago writing this book, which, as I said, it's, it's been something I've want, been wanting to do for 20 years. I like to think that, that there's some maturation that's gone on over the course of those years, so it's a good thing I didn't write it 10 years earlier. Um, and so I, I like to think that, that it just was the right time to put all these things together. Yeah, and I was going to just maybe start off by asking about the importance of this topic, because as I just mentioned before we started this, I've had friends who have left the faith um, very much related to issues concerning is science compatible with the Bible. And then right. also right. within the church, I've discovered this issue to be one that creates a lot of division and at times suspicion and there's different camps. So, you know, you've worked as, as a pastor in church ministry and then also in the seminary context. Right. How have you seen this issue to be important? What, what, what is kind of at sure. stake in it? Well, um, I mean, the, the, uh, the issue, whenever you're reading the Bible um, and when you are asking questions about its truthfulness, you really need to be asking truthfulness in what way? What is it asking, actually asking me to believe? What is it asserting that's true? Uh, and can it, um, can it convey truthful material in forms other than sort of the kind of prose that I'm used to in my background in engineering and science? Can, uh, can things that aren't in that style still be true? And, and so the, the issues of literary communication uh, and the purpose of writing and so forth and truthfulness are very tightly uh, bound together. 
and then the question of science, what, it, how, what is the relationship between science and truth is also very important to me. And so I wanted to grapple with that as well. So one of the things that, that is often assumed uh, when, when it comes to belief, and, and this often leads to the division, um, you know, you have people who are very uh, sternly holding on to their Christian faith, and then those who feel that they can't hold it anymore uh, has to do with the notion of truth and literalism. Namely, that if something's going to be true, particularly if it's going to be true history, it has to be told such that the most literal interpretation is the only honest one. And that's uh, what we face uh, with the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and that's where I think the, the division comes. Uh, if people decide, look, I can't believe that, um, uh, that, that the sky is a solid surface, for example, uh, and, but Genesis teaches that it is, then I just can't believe Genesis anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, part, part of what I wanted to do was to grapple with the issues, well, what, what, I mean, what's a really responsible way of reading this material in Genesis? And, and I mean a responsible way that doesn't get around the difficulties, but actually faces them head on. I'm not interested in any kind of get out of jail free type cards. I'm really seeking to, to do the most responsible reading that I can. Yeah. I know for me, when I've wrestled with these chapters in Genesis and this whole issue, there's been anxiety at times and how just kind of that feeling of where will mm -hmm. this end up? And mm -hmm. um, have you experienced students in the context of teaching on these things to at times yes. feel anxiety about it? And, and how do you mm -hmm. help them mm -hmm. through that? Right. Well, the first thing to say is that the anxiety uh, uh, arises because of your commitment to honesty. So the anxiety is not a bad thing. The anxiety is a, a, a good indicator. Mm. Um, I mean, I, when, when I was at the Henry Center, all of us uh, uh, at, in one way or another of the fellows at that time were working on things related to the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And, you know, the, the question must arise, where might this lead me? Mm -hmm. uh, and am I willing to follow, uh, follow the argument wherever it takes me? And, and part of our task as fellows was to encourage one another in that honesty. So I, that, that's the place I want to start, that, that um, one, one should approach uh, any, any task uh, concerned with truthfulness with, without the fear that somehow your honesty is there to be compromised. It isn't. Um, and so, uh, yes, I, I think that uh, so that anxiety existed amongst us. Uh, that anxiety exists all over the place. And I, I sense that um, in some people who want a really, uh, what, what I would think of as a safe and secure way of reading Genesis, it, it, um, it, it protects them from consequences that they don't want to follow. Mm. And I understand that. And I agree with their concern about the consequences. I just don't think that um, uh, uh, I, I just don't think that those consequences are, are really likely just because you're trying to face the difficulties. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's unique about your book is uh, C.S. Lewis, which I always yeah. love C.S. Lewis being involved in anything, but uh, I hadn't thought of him in relation to Genesis very much before reading this. Right. What made you think of him as a helpful right. dialogue partner? Well, I've, I've been reading C.S. Lewis for, well, close to 50 years, I suppose, um, and, have, uh, and like most Christians, I, uh, my introduction to Lewis was through things like Mere Christianity, the Screwtape Letters, uh, uh, and other aspects of apologetics, like the book on miracles, and of course, the Narnia stories and the Space Trilogy, and so forth. Um, but as I, as I was reading, I, um, and as I developed my appreciation for Lewis, I came to realize, well, this fellow had a day job uh, where he was teaching at Oxford, uh, and he was a scholar in, in um, uh, literature, uh, particularly uh, medieval literature coming into the early modern period. And, uh, and, and that gave him a sense of literature and how literature works, but also he had a classical education which meant that he was well aware of how rhetoric in its best sense works. And, and I realized as I was thinking about 
the study of Genesis 1 through 11, that these are the tools that, that I need, um, the, the tools from literary theory, from uh, rhetorical theory, and from aspects of linguistic theory. And, uh, as, and so as I studied those at, at a fairly technical level, I realized that many of the things that the best scholars in those disciplines are saying, uh, many of those things are already there in a sort of very intuitive form in Lewis. Uh, and um, I, I found that really intriguing and, and very engaging. And so I, uh, um, and then I began to develop this idea, okay, so I'm going to uh, produce a, what I call an intuitively critical or a critically intuitive approach to these things. And I'm going to use Lewis as my exemplar for a, a person who's uh, critically intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I found him a terrific help and, and just a, a wonderful guide to the process of reading, the process of receiving a, a literary text, and um, just the, the overall stance towards a text. Mm -hmm. So one of the essays that, that C.S. Lewis wrote that you referenced is The Language of Religion where he mm -hmm. distinguishes three kinds of language, ordinary language, uh, scientific language, and poetic language. I'm curious how you'd mm -hmm. categorize Genesis 1 through 11 in terms of those three options or what, which combination of those three you would see sure. there, and, and then what difference that makes. Right, right. And um, so this, uh, the, uh, uh, this, this is part of the larger question of how do we ascertain what kind of thing is it that I'm reading? Um, and and there's and, and what what I think is important is to separate out the different components. So there's the literary form, and the literary form is that it's all a narrative, right, right the way through, um, and that narrative will incorporate other things in it, like a genealogy and so forth. But that but still that genealogy is inserted into that narrative. Um, but then what kind of narrative is it? Um, but, uh, and so that, that then leads to the, the Lewis question. So what kind of language is used? Is it a, excuse me, is it a narrative that's told in scientific terms? Um, uh, is it a narrative that's told in more ordinary language or more poetical? My judgment is that it, it uh, is a combination of basically ordinary language and then at times some more poetical language. Uh, and. Um, so that, that then should guide us in the way we should read it, the way we should receive it, and also in what kind of truth affirmations we think the narrative might be making. Okay. So would you say the majority of it is poetical, or would you see it more in the ordinary language? Well, I, I think it just, it just sort of, uh, uh, I think from ordinary to poetical is kind of a spectrum. And, and so it just moves along that spectrum uh, from passage to passage. So, for example, I think the first chapter of Genesis is more poetical. Um, and then, then it gets into more ordinary, but, but still in, in describing the formation of the man, um, you know, there's, I think, an awful lot of imagery there. Um, and, uh, and as you move along uh, through, the, uh, through the passages, the description of the flood, uh, I think uses some hyperbole uh, and um, and so forth. And uh, when you get to the story of the Tower of Babel, you you are you're unsure, and actually all the way along, you're unsure the degree to which the uh, the narrator is aiming at. Here's what you would have seen if you'd actually been there with your own eyes, or if you'd been there with a video camera, uh, or if he's presenting the ancient events in terms that would be more familiar to the, um, to the audience. And I think it's the second. And if we want to call that poetical, I, I think that that's legitimate. Hmm. Okay. One of the things that I really appreciate about your approach is I feel like there's a lot of all or nothing thinking about Genesis 1 through 11 in terms of truth. So some people want to um, stick to truth, but they associate that with a literalistic way of reading the history. But then on the other side, you have some who um, it, it's because they don't want to read it literalistically, therefore right. they get nervous about it having historical reference and they think of it right. as more right. mythic or timeless or something like that. I have a quote here that I'll put up on the screen for people to read. I'd just be curious for you to respond to it. This is from an article in 
uh, the Westminster Theological Journal from, I think, yeah. Paul Seeley in 1991, where he's talking about the term rakia and the, mm -hmm. uh, the firmament in Genesis mm -hmm. 1. And he says, the basic fact, the basic historical fact that defines the meaning of rakia, the Hebrew word in Genesis 1, which the King James Bible re reads as firmament, but many modern translators render expanse, is simply this, all peoples in the ancient world thought of the sky as solid. So I'd love, uh, I, you address those kinds of topics yeah. a lot throughout this book. I, I'd be right. curious for how, you, how you'd right. respond to that and help us think about that kind of claim. Right, so, um, uh, well, for one thing, the, the statement is, um, what would be impossible to prove and is itself based on that kind of literalism. It assumes that there's a straightforward relationship between the, the words chosen to name something and then the internal conception uh, about that thing. So he's assuming that everybody, uh, that, um, that, that everybody who uses a term like rakia to refer to the sky is therefore um, insisting that the sky is a solid. Uh, that's highly problematic for a lot of reasons. One reason is that the only remnants we have of what anybody thought are from uh, a very small number of literary remains. Um, and if you go throughout the rest of the ancient world, most of those literary remains are produced by uh, people that are in the more elite category. Uh, and so what did ordinary people think? Well, nobody has any idea. Um, but also, um, to use, uh, uh, to, to, when, when you describe something, uh, the description rarely has to do with your internal conception of it. It's more about how you wish to portray it. So I'm at, when, I, when I use a term like that, I'm asking you to imagine the sky as if it were this way. Um, uh, and hey, we do that the, same, the exact way. Um, we say the four corners of the earth. Uh, I'm asking you to imagine the earth as if it's a flat sheet. Um, I'm not asserting that you, should, that you should believe that physically the earth is a flat sheet. Um, and, and if somebody took me as asserting that, I would be irritated because I would think that that person hadn't cooperated with me. Um, and so for the purposes of this uh, drawing of a picture that you have in Genesis 1, for example, imagine the sky as if it were this. Um, and since the language is, especially in Genesis, is more poetical, it, it would be an astonishing uh, and astonishingly bad uh, act of exegesis to suppose that that's therefore to be taken in a literalistic or scientific sense. That, that's just um, a poor reading of the text. Yeah, another example of this that I think of is uh, Dennis Lamoureux talks about the ancient science of the early chapters of Genesis, and then, and that's sort of the incident, and then there's the message, the spiritual message yeah. within yeah. that that needs to be extracted from that. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, I can't remember where I heard this, but someone used the example of um, today when we say the sun rose, or when, we, when someone right. says the sun rose at this time, it would be totally wrong to infer from that a belief about the speaker's you know, view of geocentrism or heliocentrism, or do they think the sun really rises? Um, so, so you're, you're there in California, um, and uh, you're not very far, at least with respect to me, you may think so, but you're not very far from uh, where Alan Sandage uh, lived and worked. He was the leading, um, leading observational astronomer of his generation. He died a few years ago, and as it turned out, a Christian man. Um, and so uh, that astronomer could uh, readily, in ordinary conversation, talk about the time of sunrise, and, and nobody would think that he had somehow violated his scientific integrity by using a term that is fairly conventional. And so conventionality then becomes another criterion for why do we choose a particular word? Well, it's the word that everybody uses. I'm not making any kind of claim in fact, by using a, a conventional term, I'm really just asking you to recognize the thing I'm talking about so we can move on and, and get to the stuff I'm really concerned about. Yeah. So if someone feels worried about um, this, this idea that the Bible could use ordinary language or just describe things as we experience them, mm 
um, some, some worry about that. They feel that this somehow detracts from the integrity of scripture or something like that, that the Bible would use poetry or ordinary language or just, you know, very broad descriptive language to describe something like creation or other events. How, how would you address that concern that someone has that this is somehow taking away from the divine stature of scripture in some way? Well, I, I would turn it around and say the divine stature of scripture then places upon us the responsibility to cooperate with the kind of thing that it is. So uh, you would read a psalm in a certain way uh, because it's a poem and it, it's a song to be sung. Uh, and, and if you are reading of the psalm, uh, treated it as if it were a doctrinal treatise, you would not actually be cooperating with the divine intention of the scripture. Um, and so if Genesis is conveyed in the kind of language in whatever kind of language Genesis is conveyed in, that puts on us the responsibility to discern that kind of language and then to cooperate it, to use it for the purposes that that kind of language is most suited for. If it's not in scientific language, which I think is fairly easy to demonstrate, that means that its purpose isn't really about what we would consider a scientific description of the world. And then we can look elsewhere for what its main purpose is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it, it really involves um, us sort of bringing up to the surface and evaluating. I had a preconception about what the scripture must be in order to be true and authoritative. Was my preconception really justified? Yeah, well, I often think of you with this phrase, cooperating with the text, <laughs> because uh, this was something that you really hammered into us when I was a seminary student there at Covenant Seminary. And I appreciate that because I've often thought sometimes we, the only category we have for a disrespect to scripture could be of a liberal type error, uh, mm -hmm. disrespecting its divine authority and maybe caving into higher critical methods and so forth. But it seems as though a, a fundamentalist error could also be a failure to truly honor and respect the scripture in that we're bringing our questions to the text mm -hmm. rather than allowing the text itself to oh, right. redirect us. Uh, absolutely right. I mean, and, and that's, so that's, that's the, uh, um, that, that, how shall I put this? I mean, that, that's the challenge in front of us is to learn how to cooperate with the, the different kinds of texts that, that we get in the Bible. Um, each, each book of the Bible does something different. Uh, and, um, and so there are different kinds of material that are oriented towards different purposes. And we would, it's just important for us to, to latch on to that. Um, and for example, in, in one of his parables, Jesus tells the story of a guy who owns a field and he uh, lets out the field to workers, and he goes on a journey, and then he sends uh, servants to come and collect the rents on the field. Uh, and the the, peop the uh, tenant farmers there, they abuse the servants, some of them they kill and so forth, and finally the, uh, the owner says, well, I'll send my son, surely they'll respect him. And the, uh, the tenant farmers decide, well, let's kill this guy. So, um, you know, we'll actually take possession of the field ourselves. Well, uh, you, you can tell from the context there that everybody in, in Jesus's audience knew that, that he was retelling the history of Israel with a particular end in mind. And, and he used this symbolism of uh, tenant farmers and the servants, of course, would be the prophets. And obviously you would draw the conclusion that the son would be himself. Uh, and the way of characterizing the tenant farmers really exposes the, uh, the resistance of his Jewish contemporaries so that um, he's able to tell a true historical narrative using a kind of poetical form with a particular rhetorical goal in mind. Mm. And, and the goal was achieved because it got, every, it got a lot of people mad at him. Yeah. <laughs> with, with the days of Genesis 1, one of the appeals I often meet, especially in yeah. church context, is about the, uh, a plain <clears throat> reading. And they right. say, you know, and I've heard people say, a day is a day is a day. Um, right. and, and make it like the point like that. Now, people know where <laughs> I stand on these things. So I really want to try to convey, I'm not trying to, uh, 
be disrespectful to that view or act right. as though it's dumb or something like that. Yeah. I can understand that. I can understand how people just feel this intuitive sense mm -hmm. of a day is 24 hours. Right. Um, how would you yeah. encourage us to think about that in terms of just cooperating with the text and how mm -hmm. we understand these days? Because with my work in Augustine, I, it's impressed upon me. It is really a valid question to say a plain reading to whom. Not everyone exactly. found this very plain to say it that way, but how would you speak to that? Well, and, and so that's uh, what your last comment is exactly the point, plain to whom. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting for a modern person to read Augustine's literal commentary on Genesis. Um, he, he means something li different from, uh, about literal than, than what we might mean. And, and so w w my response would be, okay, first of all, to understand. Um, so pe people who um, want to say that a day is a day are usually disturbed by those who want to say, well, a day could be a long age um, and it could be a long era. And, you know, where are the indicators in the text that allow you to say that? Um, and I, I think that's a legitimate pushback on that particular understanding. However, those aren't the only options. And that's, you know, that, that, that's the thing that, that keeps coming up is it's often, we're often presented as if there are only two options. And since it's not the one, it's gotta be the other, but, but there are more. And so um, my understanding of, of Genesis one is that, which is related to Augustine's is that these are God's work days. Uh, and so the events are portrayed this way uh, for the sake of human understanding. Um, and so to say there are God's days is to leave open exactly what they, what they were in terms of their length of time and so forth. Um, and a day is a day. Oh, really? So God's eyes, so an eye is an eye, God's arm, an arm is an arm. What? No. Um, we, we recognize that when we're talking about God, we're using analogical language, we must, uh, and, and we're comfortable with that. I mean, heavens to Betsy, it says that God rested uh, on his mm -hmm. Sabbath. Um, we don't really mean to, mean to say that God actually got tired from doing all the work. Uh, that, 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 would be, that would be blasphemous uh, in any kind of traditional understanding of the divine nature. And I'm not willing to commit a blasphemy like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me read the quote from Augustine and then one from Calvin, and this will go on the screen for people watching too. These are from pages 149 and 150 in the Reading Genesis Well book. These are about the idea of accommodation. And so then I'll ask you to comment on that idea. Mm -hmm. um, Augustine said, the scriptural style comes down to the level of the little ones and adjusts itself to their capacity. And Calvin said, in the first chapter that is of Genesis, Moses did not treat scientifically the stars as a philosopher would do. Um, some people get nervous about this idea as well, that God would accommodate his revelation to human understanding or put it in terms we can understand. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just define that idea, accommodation, right. and then uh, sure. offer any comments to address <clears throat> that concern? Well, all parents are familiar with the notion of accommodation. Anytime you try to explain things to your children, you have to accommodate their understanding or, or, or else they, they won't, you know, they, they won't feel like you cared about them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and my, my wife was very good at this when my kids were small. Um, you know, she, uh, so for example, in explaining where babies come from, she uh, told the kids that God takes a little bit from the dad and a little bit from the mom and mixes them together in the mommy's tummy. And then, uh, and then there comes a baby. Um, well, that's, uh, that's marvelous. Um, and, you know, it leaves out a lot, you know, how the bits got together and so forth. But um, uh, um, it, it, it addresses the question that the child has and doesn't confuse the child with things that aren't on his or her mind uh, and, and also does proper justice to God's involvement in the whole process. Uh, and so, you know, that's when, when we talk about accommodation, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's sort of uh, addressing the kinds of things that would be a matter of concern to the audience um, and addresses those things from, from within the level of experience that the audience has uh, and 
allows them to learn other things later uh, when, you know, should the, the issue come up later. And, and of course, my kids have had to learn that stuff. They're, they're both adults. And so now, now they know more. But, but, in, but under no circumstances would they be entitled to say that their mother misled them with the accommodation. Mm -hmm. She just didn't tell them everything. Um, and, and then, I'll, and then um, since in Genesis, what we have is the use of ordinary and poetical language, you know, we, we can say that this is an appropriate way of describing the things. And if I wanted to describe them scientifically, I might use different terminology and might say some different things. But saying it differently scientifically is not the same as saying that the previous description was false. It, it wasn't false. It was quite appropriate for the particular communication. Mm. So if anyone out there is watching this and, you know, we're giving lots of qualifications about how to be careful in reading Genesis 1 through 11, and at the same time, and they're wondering, okay, but what's the main idea of these chapters? Mm. What would you say are the main points because in the book, you talk a lot about the worldview formation for the ancient Israelites. Right, and right. These, these chapters, it's not as though they're, they're so complicated, we don't know what they're saying. Right. Uh, what are these chapters designed to do for us? Well, and, and so w what are they designed to do and how are they designed to do it? Th those are, uh, 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 you know, sort of inextricably intertwined questions. Uh, and so I'll start with how is it designed to do it? Because a lot of the discussions about Genesis seem to assume that the way you would um, uh, consume the book of Genesis is by yourself, uh, reading it by yourself or perhaps with your family. Whereas in ancient Israel, Genesis was a part of the weekly readings in the gathered, in the gathered worship of the people of God. Uh, and so, you know, the function of worship is to celebrate the greatness of God, to celebrate the privileges of being members of God's people, to uh, reaffirm our commitment to obeying and loving uh, the Lord, uh, and so forth. So, and that's so. We would ask, how does the material in Genesis serve those functions uh, of a worshiping community? Uh, and certainly, what it and and also, uh, I I should add, that community already has some experience. That they're, they're not um, uh, they're not starting with a blank slate. This is the the um, ideal audience is the group of people that's going to follow Joshua into the promised land. Um, and so they already know about the Exodus. Uh, and so they already know that the Lord has defeated the gods of Egypt. They already know that the Lord has brought his people through the Red Sea, that he parted the Red Sea. And they, they walked through on dry ground, and then the Lord drowned the Egyptian army. They know that the Lord has preserved their ancestors through the uh, 38 years in the wilderness. Um, and, uh, and so what do these people need? They, they need a, a, a high vision of God, and they also need uh, their loyalty to be recruited uh, to God and to be reaffirmed because they're about to do something that, you know, is scary. They're, they're about to go into somebody else's land and, and take it. Um, and so they need to know that the God who has called them to do this is, in fact, the universal creator, uh, who has a plan for all humankind, that Israel serves a purpose within that plan, namely to be the vehicle of, of blessing to all humankind. They need to know that this God is not dependent on his creation, but rather rules his creation, uh, so that when they're settled in the land and they're carrying out their practices of farming and so forth, they're not going to resort to the deities that that uh, other peoples might tell them to resort to, but they're going to stay firm in their commitment to the one true God. He's the one who makes sure that the rain falls uh, in its proper time. He's the one who makes sure that the crops grow and that the animals have their young and, and so forth. Um, and so that it's loyalty to him, cooperation with his purposes of uh, character formation amongst the people, you know, developing this sacred community that is uh, fully loyal to the one true God, I mean, that that's, that's what they're here for. Uh, and so, um, you know, Genesis 1 through 11 is especially set towards the magnificence of God, the transcendent creator who brought everything into being, but also um, the, the universality, namely everything came into being, including all humankind, and then Israel 
as the descendants of Abram are just one small subset of all humankind, but they are going to be the vehicle of blessing to the rest of the world. And so Genesis 1 through 11 then serves as the front end to the Abraham story, which is the front end of the whole Bible story. Mm. So that's, that's how the whole thing works. Yeah. And that's in opposition to the rival stories, namely that the world came about by other means, say by, um, you know, one of the rival stories is that you have the, the senior gods and the junior gods. This is from Mesopotamia. And the junior gods were doing all the hard work of, of working the ground, digging the irrigation channels and so forth. And they didn't like it. So they went on strike. Um, and so the gods decided, okay, here's how we're going to solve this. We'll have uh, humans who will do all the hard work. And so, uh, you know, that, that, that's why humans have to work the soil in Mesopotamia. Uh, and and the, the uh, majority of people in Mesopotamia were in this lower class, the, the lower socio socioeconomic scale. And their job was simply to do the things that their superiors told them to do and, you know, get back to work, but you're complaining and just do it because if they objected to that, they'd be fighting against the deities, which would never end well. And then the upper echelons of, uh, of the social structure were closer to the deities and more representative uh, of the deities. Um, and so Genesis, in contrast to that, uh, you know, is sort of bringing all humans into, a, uh, a, into the same level. It's sort of rejecting this stratified society. And it's, it's also seeing work as dignified that rather than the work that the gods don't want to do, uh, it is in fact the, the dignified human work of representing God by ruling his creation as a faithful farmer. Yeah. So, I mean, th those are the kinds of things that Genesis will do to shape the worldview of, of the ancient people of Israel. And then it comes, then it, it fits into the whole biblical story. Um, so uh, I think Ortland, if I remember right, is a, a Swedish name. Is, um, and so, so the Swedes are, uh, generally speaking, not of uh, the Semitic caste. Uh, and so very Gentile. Um, your ancestors, uh, Gavin, I think the Apostle Paul wouldn't have spoken of the wild olive branches uh, in Romans 11, but very wild. <laughs> uh, and, and, and mine too, because mine are, are Germanic and Celtic as well. And so, uh, you know, we, we've been brought into this whole family of God. Um, and so this, uh, you know, this is the story into which you and I have been incorporated. Um, and it's the story in which you and I are participants. I mean, God intends to bless the whole world through his people. And that's what we get to do. Mm. I mean, that's part of the privilege of, of our membership in the people of God. And the creator that we serve is the universal creator who's not limited in his power much as we might fear that he is, you know, if we just sort of look out at our social, you know, current social setting, uh, we, we might be tempted to be driven by fear. But Genesis um, speaks to our fears and, and helps us to overcome them. Mm. Well, let me just ask one, one more question that, that, that springs right from that, because I, when I hear you describe that, as I've felt this way from the book and in times in the past as well, I find that a, a, an enchanting and wonderful worldview. I, I find that just especially just sort of enthralling because when you consider, say, a naturalistic worldview, an atheistic worldview, and where that leaves you with, and then you consider these early chapters of Genesis, it gives us such dignity and, and it, it provides such a, a meaning and context mm -hmm. to the struggle of life that we all find ourselves in. And I'm just, uh, I'd love for you to speak to someone watching this who may not be a follower of Christ or right. someone who considers them a believer in God, or maybe wrestling with that deeply, how, what do the early chapters of Genesis give us? What, yeah. how, you know, what do they provide for us that we, right. we might not find elsewhere? Well, um, one of the things I've, I've done to try to make sure that, that I don't live in a bubble is to talk with people throughout the world um, from like Thailand and Japan and China uh, and the Middle East, um, uh, African-Americans and, and so forth, just to, to, to make sure I'm not just living, you know, w within a, a very secure little bubble here. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they, they have agreed that there is a sense of sort of a universal sense of yearning that, 
that there is something that is off, uh, out of kilter about the world that, that we experience. And not necessarily about the things in the world, but, but about the people in the world, the way they behave, uh, that, it, that it's not consistent with the way things ought to be. Um, and, and there's all, usually a deeper yearning be, um, that the, in addition to that, uh, a, a yearning for a, a, a meaning and an actual purpose for their own existence, uh, for some kind of transcendence. Um, and so I think Genesis speaks to that deep yearning uh, and, and explains it for us. Uh, it, um, it has the ring of truth that the reason that, that people are out of kilter is that they are actually out of kilter, that, that there's a real, that, that there's some real sense in which we were made to behave one way but we behave differently and all of us behave differently from how we were made to behave because something has come in to corrupt us. Uh, and that's, that's what Christians have traditionally referred to as the fall. Um, but it's something that, that rings true. Um, you know, when, when we look at the way people behave and we say they shouldn't behave like that, we're holding them up to a standard that's external to human behavior. And, and we're right to do so. Uh, and so Genesis is, sort of affirming that intuitive sense that there is this standard external to us to which we're accountable. And the problem is, the problem with that standard is that we don't live by it, but we still acknowledge it. And the reason we don't live by it is because something has corrupted human nature. Uh, and then we might hope that there's a remedy for that. And of course, the, the Christian message and the biblical message in general is that God does have a remedy for that. He doesn't sort of, uh, you know, uh, dust his hands off and say, well, I'm done with you. But instead, he pursues human beings. He wants to develop relationships, not simply with human individuals, but with human communities. He wants, wants to see us living in communities that are bound together uh, with love and, and equity uh, and fair, square dealing, uh, all those sorts of things. A, a community centered on worship of the one true God. Um, and, you know, that that, that that corresponds to what we find in ourselves. Interestingly enough, um, this book, um, let's see if I can get it in, in uh, focus there, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, uh, written about, uh, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I think now. Um, but, but he was addressing the question, why good people are divided by politics and religion? Um, and so he's wondering why people of different political persuasions can't talk to each other. That sound, sounds like a timely book, I should think. But, but one of the things he, he does is, is uh, describe with a moral foundations theory what seems to be a universal uh, set of moral foundations that are characteristic of all what he calls conservative or traditional societies. Um, and I, I, I think he's onto something there. And, you know, so that, that there is... Um, that there is this universal sense that 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 a well-functioning society ought to recognize uh, and ought to aspire to the performance of these these moral universals, and that um, uh, you know and now a, a a that that we ought to aspire to that that we ought to nurture amongst ourselves that aspiration. But um, one of the things he doesn't address is the problem is that we don't. Uh, and so he doesn't get into the question of what do we do with our failures? And that, that's okay. That's not his problem. But, um, but it is the kind of thing that the Christian message addresses. What, what do we do with our failures? Mm. And, that, and addressing our failures gives us hope that we can actually see then healthy communities created, which is certainly one of your goals as a pastor, is to see your congregation be a healthy, thriving community where true humanness is on display. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's what we aspire to. And so I, now your non-believing viewer, you know, you still have responsibilities to ascertain, yeah, but is, it's, it might sound good, but is it true? And so there are things that you want to pursue further. And I would strongly recommend reading things like C.S. Lewis uh, in that regard. But, um, but, but at least you can see that it answers to things that you know to be true about yourself. Mm, yeah. I'll put a link to the Jonathan Haidt book, The Righteous Mind, in the video description of this video. And where, if someone wants to purchase reading Genesis well, is there a preferred place that you 
you prefer them to get that or are you open to any Amazon, any bookstore or any place like that? And any, I, I don't know of any preferred spot. Um, gosh, you know, that, that's a good point. I, ne I never thought of, of uh, getting a share that way, but uh, no, if, if they get it through Amazon or from the publisher Zondervan or any other, or Barnes and Noble, whatever, it, it's great. It, um, and I just hope that people buy the book and read it. Yeah, great. Okay, well, I'll put a link to the Amazon uh, page for this book as well. So, Jack, thanks so much for joining me for the discussion. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I wish you God's blessings and God's blessings to uh, those who view your channel as well. It's, it's been a pleasure.